Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Today we'll be uh, providing a brief COVID update with modeling and data from Commissioner Pichek and a health update from Commissioner Levine, and then move to today's press conference topic. This afternoon, my office will again send a list of this week's vaccination clinics because, as I said, we're not letting up on ma making vaccines easy to obtain. There was a White House call today. Uh, the Surgeon General discussed that the rise in cases we're seeing across the country is largely driven by the unvaccinated which is why it's still important for us to push vaccinations in our states. I did ask them about the Canadian border following Canada's positive announcement yesterday. Unfortunately, they continued to defer, which is disappointing because I believe it's past time <clears throat> to open the border. After I spoke, uh, Governor Inslee from Washington State jumped in to share similar concerns as did uh, Governor Mills from Maine. So I specifically requested a briefing from the White House team with all northern border state governors and my friend uh, Governor Hutchinson, the NGA chair, assured us they'd put something together. So stay tuned. Uh, at this point, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Pichek for a quick modeling update before coming back to talk about infrastructure. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Governor, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first, updating our vaccination progress. Uh, an additional 2,258 Vermonters started vaccination this week, increasing the percentage of eligible, eligible Vermonters who have received at least one dose of the vaccine to a nation-leading 83.2%. And Vermont continues to be the national leader across the board when it comes to vaccination progress. And looking at progress across our vaccination age bands, we can now see uh, the slow and steady progress made, being made generally, but specifically with 18 uh, to 21 year olds now being over that 50% threshold. Uh, Vermont has seen its second week of increased cases, reporting uh, 89 cases this week compared to 54 last week. The majority of these cases continue to be in the unvaccinated population here in Vermont. And when we look at cases by age, we can see that cases continue to remain very low in the 60 and older population, the population that is most at risk for COVID-19, but also the population that is the most protected against that virus. And while we're seeing some slight increases among the population and those who are under 60 years old, uh, which again isn't quite as well protected as those over 60, uh, overall, we can see that cases continue to be very low uh, compared to where they were uh, just a few months ago. And looking at the most recent forecasts, we do expect cases to be a little more elevated than they were during the month of June. Again, largely driven by the more transmissible Delta variant spreading among those who remain unvaccinated here in Vermont. Turning to hospitalizations, Vermont continues to have the lowest hospitalization rates in the country. And we see that the seven-day averages in the state are continuing to trend down, uh, with those requiring critical care being at a very low level. We did report a fatality this week, the first reported death in the month of July. But again, driven by our very high vaccination rates generally, and specifically among those who are most vulnerable, uh, we continue to forecast a very low fatality rate uh, for the foreseeable future. The rising case rates is obviously not something that's confined to Vermont. In the Northeast, cases rose 68.7% this week, with the region reporting over 10,000 cases for the first time in seven weeks. But we can see the Northeast hospitalizations continue to remain stable, which isn't necessarily true for other parts of the country. For example, in the South, which is the least vaccinated region of the country, their hospitalizations are more than 300% higher than us here in the Northeast. And again, as the CDC has reported, whether in the Northeast or other parts of the country, 97% of those requiring hospitalizations recently were unvaccinated uh, individuals. And we can see uh, that this rise in hospitalizations is driven by the increasing prevalence of the Delta variant uh, in certain parts of the country, uh, which again is spreading quickly among 
the unvaccinated population. Just this morning, the CDC estimates that 83% of all cases uh, are now made up of the Delta variant, and some models push that number as high as 90%. And we can see here in some uh, time-lapse graphics just exactly how the spread is occurring in other parts of the country. When on June uh, 20, uh, 22nd, when the Delta variant maybe made up about 50% of cases, uh, some of those cases started to take hold in southern uh, Missouri, uh, a little bit in other parts of the south. Uh, but just two weeks ago, we can see how that spread uh, again to other parts of Missouri, into Arkansas, and starting to see spread in other parts of the South, particularly in Florida. And now today, you can see how that spread has continued to be in much of the entire state of Arkansas, Missouri, uh, into parts of Louisiana, and of course, uh, also in, in Florida as well. So those are some of the states that, again, see the lowest vaccination rates uh, in the country. Uh, in the Northeast, where, where we have the highest vaccination rates, we continue to be uh, well protected. Um, but again, as the governor said, uh, for that, you know, 92,000 remaining uh, Vermonters uh, that are not yet vaccinated, certainly a good reason to go out and do so today. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Levine. <clears throat> Thank you. So we continue to hear about the Delta variant's role in accelerating spread of COVID across the country. In Vermont, though, we are well protected with high vaccination rates. But even here, as you've seen, we've had a small increase in cases, likely the result of this more transmissible variant. But in light of the vaccination rate, we've seen no big outbreaks. So what do you need to know now? First, anyone who is not vaccinated is at risk. And with this more contagious variant, a higher risk than ever before. The more people we can get vaccinated, the more we can keep up that protection. Second, the vaccines are doing exactly what they are supposed to do, preventing the most serious effects of COVID-19, severe illness, hospitalization, and deaths. We've already seen how these numbers dropped in Vermont as our vaccination rate increased. The vast majority of hospitalizations and deaths nationwide, meaning well over 90%, are among the unvaccinated. Next, you may hear about a small number of uh, vaccinated people who test positive, so-called breakthrough cases. I want you to know that this is not unexpected since no vaccine prevents 100% of infections. But as you saw in the data, our incidence rate of new cases among unvaccinated individuals is 12 times that of those who are vaccinated. We know from national data that the Delta variant accounts for the majority of virus in the U.S., and it's expected to continue increasing in all regions. So while the proportion of cases among the vaccinated population has increased over the last few months, what we're seeing is that the people who become cases but who have been vaccinated are not likely to get very sick. In addition, we're learning from other countries, specifically England and Israel, that have earlier experience with Delta. We know that one dose of the two-dose mRNA vaccine is not as protective against Delta as it has been against previous circulating viruses. So completing the two-dose series is really important. This is the nature of vaccines, effectively controlling spread of infections and keeping everyone as safe and healthy as possible. We're now more than a year out with those who started getting the vaccine as part of the large trials, and I am reassured by the science that shows the vaccines now protect millions of people without any major long-term concerns. So please consider this fact if you've been waiting to see what happens to those who got vaccinated, because the answer is effective protection vastly reduces serious illness and hospitalizations and no lasting side effects. And for the few who may have possible symptoms, stay home if you're sick and consider getting tested, especially if you're not vaccinated. This will help protect everyone around you. 
The healthvermont.gov slash COVID-19 website continues to have a map of available testing centers and now a map of vaccine locations as well. And I'd like to just close on a non-COVID topic, as especially if you're spending time in the water this summer, especially days a bit less rainy than today, make sure to check for cyanobacteria blooms before you go in. Reports of these blooms have already temporarily closed beaches in Lake Champlain. You may have also heard this called blue-green algae. It can cause skin rashes, diarrhea, sore throat, stomach problems, or more serious health concerns. Be especially careful with small children and dogs who may drink or lick the water. You can see what to look for and get a whole host of pictures to help guide you at healthvermont.gov slash cyanobacteria. I'll turn this back to Governor Scott now. Thank you, Commissioner Levine. As you might have heard, I was invited to the White House last week to discuss the bipartisan infrastructure framework which is being worked on in the Senate. And just to be clear, this is a separate proposal from the $3.5 trillion reconciliation package that's also being considered. In addition to the Vice President and President, the meeting included two other governors, the Secretary of Commerce, Secretary of Labor, and a bipartisan group of five mayors. We had a very candid conversation about the package and how it would help our respective states and cities. I think the need to upgrade our physical infrastructure is something most Americans can agree on. This is an issue Republicans and Democrats have talked about for years, and I think we have a real opportunity to finally get something done. The infrastructure package uh, is about $1.3 trillion, uh, and the package includes over $100 billion for roads and bridges, $7.5 billion for electrical, uh, electric vehicle infrastructure, which we've already made a priority here in Vermont, another $7 billion for electric buses to help reduce our carbon emissions, and it includes billions for airports and rail. Uh, this uh, bipartisan agreement also includes $55 billion for water and sewer, $65 billion for broadband, which, by the way, should allow us to complete every county when combined with the ARPA money we've already allocated, uh, over $20 billion to remediate some of the many polluted sites across the country, as well as over $70 billion to modernize the power grid. And we've been assured this will be fully paid for without raising taxes on working families. At uh, my meeting, I told the president and others that we have great needs here in Vermont with a lot of deferred maintenance, but we need as much flexibility as possible for states because our needs in Vermont are much different than those in our uh, neighbors to the south, New Jersey, for example. We're still waiting on a final bill to be released, but I know they're getting close. And I can't stress enough how significant this would be. Not only could this, uh, or would this make us more competitive, uh, create good paying jobs, and help modernize our country, but it would also be a much needed moral victory for a very polarized nation. After all the division and partisanship we've seen over the past several years, coming together with a major bipartisan piece of legislation would help us take a step towards unity, and I hope bring down the partisan temperature in D.C. It's important that Washington proves to the American people that when we share a common goal, we can deliver results. So I hope the Senate moves quickly on this package once it's finalized. I want to thank the Republican and Democratic senators who've been working diligently to find common ground, and I want to thank the Biden administration for their commitment as well. I'll now turn it over to Secretary Flynn to talk about the importance of these infrastructure investments.
Thank you, Governor. Uh, good afternoon. As the Governor has said, the overarching goal of the bipartisan infrastructure framework is for the nation to rebuild its infrastructure with $312 billion all toll going directly to fix highways, rebuild bridges, and upgrading transit systems, rail, and airports. The first component of the framework package is, as the governor said, $109 billion for highways and bridges. This funding will be used to modernize bridges, highways, roads, and main streets that are in most critical need of repair. This includes funding to improve air quality, limit greenhouse gas emissions, and reduce congestion. In Vermont, we have just over 500 interstate bridges, nearly 2,000 state highway bridges, and more than 3,000 town highway bridges. Approximately 2% of our interstate bridges, 4% of our state bridges, and 2% of town highway bridges are deemed structurally deficient. I want to emphasize, while structurally deficient does not mean unsafe, these bridges do score below targeted goals for condition. Vermont has 2,700 miles of interstate and state centerline roadway, and VTRANS maintains over 6,500 miles of paved road. While 62% of these miles of pavement are in fair to good condition, approximately one-third are in poor condition or very poor condition. Also in Vermont, we have 49,000 small culverts along the interstate and state highway system and 86,000 small culverts under town highways. The infrastructure package also funds major highway safety and proposes investments to improve road safety for all users, including increases to existing traffic programs and a new safe streets for all program to reduce crashes and fatalities, especially for cyclists and pedestrians. Similar to national trends, Vermont saw an increase in fatal crashes and fatalities between 2019 and 2020. Unfortunately, that trend continues today in 2021. Public transit is also addressed in this package. The nation's current public transit infrastructure is just inadequate. The U.S. Department of Transportation estimates a repair backlog of over $105 billion in transit equipment. This magnitude of deferred maintenance results in service delays and disruptions that leave riders stranded and frankly discourage transit use. Funding will be used to modernize existing transit and help agencies expand their systems to meet rider demand. This investment will double federal funding for public transit and bring bus and commuter rail service to communities and neighborhoods across the nation. Vermont intends to build upon the successful microtransit service in Montpelier and expand it to communities throughout Vermont. We have 12 feasibility studies planned for this year. We are also looking to expand other demand response services as well. These improve access to job opportunities, support those in recovery, and ensures residents have the mobility to essential services and contribute to economic activity. Vermont has 430 transit vehicles in its fleet statewide, all of which eventually need replacement. We currently have electric buses totaling 18 either on the ground or in order or on order. New transit maintenance facilities and administrative facilities are also needed in Randolph, Brattleboro, and in here in Washington County, as well as upgrades and improvements to transit facilities in Lindenville, Middlebury, and Southeast Vermont. The bipartisan package also addresses rail. Nationally, rail lacks a dedicated multi-year federal funding stream to address deferred maintenance and enhance existing corridors and build new lines in high potential locations. There are currently projects around the country just waiting to be funded that will provide reliable and fast inner city train service and shippers reliable freight rail service. In Vermont, we own 305 miles 
of the 578 miles of active rail within the state. Our western corridor, north of Rutland to Burlington, is nearly complete. Vermont has major re rehabilitation and replacement needs along the Connecticut River line between Newport and White River Junction, and along the Vermont Railway from Rutland south to Hoosick, New York. The bipartisan funding framework also has provisions for airport funding in the package. This funding is designed to undertake critical investments in our airports, including upgrades to FAA assets that ensure safe and efficient air travel, and a new program for terminal support renovations. Vermont owns nine general aviation airports and one commercial service airport. Our state-owned airports are in need of upgrades, including runway extensions, taxiways and aprons, fuel infrastructure, and terminal buildings. And electrification improvements are also needed to meet the development of the next generation electric aircraft, such as those from Beta Technologies here in Vermont. The framework also proposes funding for electric vehicles to enable automakers to spur domestic supply chains for raw materials to parts and retool factories to compete globally. It will give consumers point of sale rebates and tax incentives to buy American made EVs while ensuring these vehicles are affordable for all families. Vermont has made a significant investment in EV charging facilities. Vermont has the greatest number of EV stations in the nation per capita, with 114 public EV stations per 100,000 people. And the number of EVs registered in the state of Vermont, which is currently about 3,700, has risen by over 300% since just 2015. In order to maximize the investment outcomes envisioned under this framework, we are truly hoping transportation funding will be provided through existing highway and transit formulas and existing rail grant programs at 100% federal share in order to deploy economic recovery funding in the quickest and most efficient manner to rural and urban areas of every state. We are also asking that short obligation deadlines be avoided in order to support programs and projects that generate the most benefit throughout the entire life cycle of the asset, ranging from routine improvements that can provide immediate economic stimulus to major improvements that can substantially transform our transportation network. And in general, we have asked Congress and the administration to provide maximum flexibility, as you heard the governor say, in the use of bipartisan framework package funding and avoid a one-size-fits-all approach as our state, like others, has unique transportation investment needs. So you can see just how much the bipartisan infrastructure framework can mean for the state of Vermont, helping to address critical transportation needs. This is why we are very excited about the proposed investment in the transportation infrastructure, and we are following this very closely. And now I will turn this over to Commissioner Tierney. Thank you, Secretary Flynn. Um, as you may be aware, if you've looked at the proposed framework that's come out of Washington, uh, 65 billion alone has been proposed for energy investment and another substantial portion for broadband as well. Um, forgive me, that's 65 billion on broadband and 70 billion for, tra for um, energy. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, first about broadband and then about the uh, energy applications of this money. The framework for the infrastructure bill in acknowledges that broadband is infrastructure meaning that it's equivalent to something like a highway. Now that is new, and therefore good news. It signals a very important step forward in federal policy and budget thinking around broadband. It shows that Washington is finally starting to get the message broadband is a necessity, not a nice to have alternative to landline telephones or cable television. And like a road system, 
Vermont's broadband road system needs work, continuous work. Some roads need to be built, some roads need to be upgraded, and some roads need to be redesigned. Thankfully, we have nine communications union districts in the state throughout Vermont that are already hard at work on building the many last mile broadband roads we need to connect our 54,000 unserved or underserved addresses, meaning places that do not currently have access to service of 25.3 megabits per second, which is the current federal definition of high-speed broadband. It is therefore very encouraging to see that the bipartisan framework expressly aims to provide technical assistance to communities seeking to expand broadband, and that long-term planning for spending is encouraged. That kind of technical assistance and approach will strongly support our CUDs as they work to meet the last mile needs in their respective communities. At this time, the new Vermont Community Broadband Board has an appropriation from our legislature and signed by the governor of $150 million of ARPA funding in FY22. And this is seed money for the CUDs to reach those 54,000 unserved or underserved addresses. The expectation is there will be an additional 100 million of ARPA funding to follow in the next two years. Still, Vermont needs more. For context, the estimated cost alone for the CUD's foundational work on achieving universal access is between 362 million and 439 million. For more context, to get 100 up, 100 down fiber for all Vermont addresses, it is estimated to cost a billion dollars. So, as you can see, securing some part of the $67 billion for Vermont for broadband funding is highly desirable. It's also encouraging to see that the bipartisan framework includes funding to bring down high-speed internet prices across the board. The price of high-speed broadband service is another compelling challenge that Americans face across the nation, notwithstanding that competitive markets exist to set these prices. The story is the same in Vermont, where pricing for broadband service has only recently begun to receive attention, not because it isn't an issue here, but because the absence of physical access for so many has dominated for so long, thereby crowding out the conversation about the cost for the service, both once the connection is built and also for those who may be staring out their dining room windows at fiber lines that pass them by and might just as well not be there because the service they carry is simply not affordable. Turning to electric transmission funding, the bipartisan framework contemplates creating a centralized grid development authority at the Federal Department of Energy and appropriating 70 billion of funding for that. This is a long overdue recognition that grid resiliency and greening are not just regional or state issues. These are issues of national import as well and therefore are in need of funding for planning and development on a scale that only the National Treasury can facilitate. What this means for Vermont is that we will have a strong federal partner to focus robust resources on ensuring that the renewable energy policies that Vermont and our fellow New England states have enacted are implementing, implemented to lasting effect for our regional grid. We urgently need to make more progress on integrating renewable generation resources into our grid, both from a physical transmission perspective and in our regional wholesale market designs. For many years, the states have been taking the lead in affecting grid greening and modernization in the United States, but overarching federal momentum is needed as well, and the bipartisan framework signals a solid step in that direction. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Secretary Moore. Thank you, Commissioner Tierney. Good afternoon. The passage of long-term and comprehensive infrastructure funding is an incredible opportunity to build, rebuild aging systems in Vermont, including drinking water and wastewater, to remediate and redevelop brownfield properties and other contaminated sites, and address the challenges posed by climate change. While we await final details of the bill, some priorities that are important to Vermonters include continued support for our water infrastructure, including programs necessary to achieve clean drinking water and improve wastewater treatment. 
Over the next 10 years, we estimate that Vermont's water infrastructure will require investments of more than $2 billion. Investments in things like refurbishing Vermont's 92 existing municipal wastewater treatment systems, repairs and upgrades to many of the state's more than 400 community drinking water systems, almost 75% of which serve populations of less than 500. Installing stormwater management practices, which are critical to addressing the harmful algal blooms Dr. Levine referred to in his opening remarks, and achieving our water quality goals in places like Lake Champlain and Lake Memphremagog. Deploying nature-based solutions like floodplain and wetland restoration to minimize the impacts of extreme weather. And in addition, the federal infrastructure package would include funding to help prepare more of our infrastructure for the impacts of climate change and extreme weather events. From 2010 to 2020, Vermont has experienced extreme weather events that caused more than a billion dollars in damages. The federal package is anticipated to enhance the resiliency of our infrastructure and support communities' recovery from disaster by investing in the resilience of both physical and natural systems. We are also anticipating the federal infrastructure package would include funding for brownfields remediation, an area, again, where Vermont has significant need. Our best estimate is that there are more than 5,000 large and small brownfield properties in Vermont, at least one in almost every community in the state, as well as allow for significant investments needed to complete remediation work at several former mine sites and other facilities on the national priority list. COVID-19 recovery dollars and the availability of one-time state monies are allowing us to initiate and accelerate work in many of these areas in a way that is unparalleled in my professional career. With planned investments this fiscal year of $100 million in water infrastructure and $25 million in brownfield remediation and redevelopment. We are incredibly grateful to Vermont's federal delegation for their role in securing COVID-19 recovery dollars for rural states like Vermont and our own legislature for working with us to prioritize investments in core infrastructure. These dollars are a short-term funding opportunity that invest in the economic recovery of our communities and support vulnerable Vermonters. While these dollar figures are significant and impactful, given the magnitude of the need, they are also a down payment on this core infrastructure. Timely passage of a federal infrastructure package will allow Vermont to build on the momentum created by these current investments to make transformational improvements that will serve to support Vermonters for decades with high quality waters and a cleaner environment. And with that, I will turn it back over to the governor. Thank you, Secretary Moore. And with that, I'll open up to questions. Passes. How transformative do you think it could be when you think about the Rural Electrification Act and then the highway system under President Eisenhower? Where does something like this rank in the grand scheme of major infrastructure projects in America? Well, it certainly will be a milestone and significant uh, when you think about all the pieces within uh, the infrastructure plan. Uh, again, to, to recognize that there's so much deferred maintenance, first of all, so a portion of it takes care of that, and the, uh, and the needs for future investments with electrification and so forth uh, is equally as important. So I think it's, uh, it, it rates uh, right up there with, uh, again, significant investments in infrastructure and the milestone uh, that it would provide, and again, um, bringing us up the ladder, so to speak. We're, I think right now we're, I may have this wrong, but I think we're, we're 25th uh, in the world in terms of our infrastructure. And we're a young country and a wealthy country, and we should be up at least in the top five. And uh, so we have some ground to gain, and, uh, and this is a step in the right direction. Regarding the, the algae blooms and some of this federal cash we might be seeing, you know, Secretary Moore said there's, there's money for storm water, but, but what about agriculture runoff and, and phosphorus? I mean, can, can we be doing more, I guess? You know, well, I, we, we can always do more, uh, but we've made, again, significant gains in this area over the last uh, three years since we all came together and decided on um, a, a financial package to go along with clean water. 
And so we never promised, uh, and I, I'm, at least I have not, and I'm sure many others have not either, we didn't get into this situation overnight. This is the result of, of uh, years, uh, decades of uh, phosphorus going into our lakes and streams and then ending up in some of our uh, major bodies of water. And so it's embedded uh, in the silt. Um, it's there for a while. It's going to take a, a, a long time for us uh, to, to work our way out of this. Uh, we predicted about 20 years. That's why uh, the financial package was uh, over a 20-year period. So um, again, I'm sure we could do more, uh, but we have other needs as well. And, and we're, we're investing uh, about, I think it's 50 million a year at this point uh, in our, uh, the cleanup of our streams and, uh, and, uh, and lakes and ponds. Secretary Moore, you wanna add sure. anything to that? Um, I would just note that, that the, uh, the COVID relief funding that we have in hand does have uh, some ability to be used for best management practices on farms, infrastructure projects, manure pits, silage leachate treatment systems and the like. The Clean Water Board will be meeting the first week in August to take that up, to look at the, the ARPA allocation that has been directed to the Clean Water Board, which is $10 million in fiscal year 22. It's in addition to the $50 million, roughly, that the governor spoke to uh, that's in, in direct state funding um, and may rejigger some of the, the ways that the state dollars are being deployed in light of what those federal dollars can be used for. But so there will be, a, I think, an across the board acceleration of that work. Uh, it's less clear to me what the opportunities may be in the, the, the larger federal infrastructure package, but certainly with those ARPA funds, there is an, an opportunity to accelerate agricultural improvements as well. Governor, how does this uh, dovetail with the plan to start a fund for um, innovation in, in farming and here in the state to bring that back? And how does that dovetail into maybe this money and, uh, and uh, efforts to make uh, improvements to the farming and agriculture community? Yeah, a separate initiative in some respects, but it does dovetail nicely with what everything we're trying to do, uh, whether it be improving the economy, uh, keeping agriculture alive uh, and well here in Vermont. And uh, this is uh, something that uh, Kenley Squire has uh, moved forward with, the Innovation Fund that he's uh, trying to uh, push forward with. We'll have a significant uh, uh, hand in the future for agriculture here in Vermont. But again, everything that we're doing, uh, you know, is based on those uh, three principles, growing the economy, making Vermont more affordable, protecting the most vulnerable, and protecting uh, agriculture in Vermont while making sure that we're cleaning up our lakes and streams uh, is some, something that uh, works together. And uh, I think we can have both. What's the total Vermont benefit from this 1.3? Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't know if there's enough uh, detail at this point in time to come up with that figure. But uh, it is uh, when you when you look at what ARPA uh, was, uh, for instance, um, I think you can quickly uh, come to the conclusion that this will will be about a billion to two billion. I, I believe somewhere in that category, this infrastructure package. This is the $1.3 trillion infrastructure package. I ask you a question about the board. It might be for Dr. Levine. Um, so Canada announced yesterday that we can travel north if we're fully vaccinated and we have a PCR test within 72 hours of crossing. How are we going to get a PCR test within 72 hours of, of wanting to go up to Montreal or something? Uh, will the state allow residents to go get one somewhere uh, for that purpose? We are still uh, testing, uh, and so that would be acceptable, and I believe that uh, the turnaround time could be within that, that period, of, uh, a period of time. Um, I think the, the bigger question, as you reflect on that, is how do you get back? Um, so, I mean, you can go across the border. They're accepting. Uh, visitors to the north, but right now the border is not open to come back. So this is something that's going to have to work. I mean, you can get through the Canadian uh, side, but you got to come back into the states, right? So I, I don't know if that's something. That's 
that's an issue that I'd like to talk with the White House about um, because it's one thing for the Canadian the Prime Minister to open up uh, their side of uh, the border to allow entry, but we have to make some accommodation to get back. So it's your understanding that, that the American border would deny an American entry? I, I don't know. I think, I think it's, a, it's a question that is, uh, remains unanswered. Uh, because that's what I was asking about. You know, I thought there was going to be some reciprocity when they work together. They've been in talks over the last uh, couple of weeks, and uh, they clearly didn't have uh, answers this morning. Maybe they're, they'll come to some uh, agreement, conclusion, uh, but, um, but I think that this creates maybe some more confusion. At least it does on my part. Well, on the testing issue, uh, where where do you go to get a test in seventy-two there, there hours? And, and is it paid for by the government? Yeah. Yes, it is. Uh, it is paid for. The tests are still free. We have like sixteen or seventeen fixed sites uh, throughout the state that are still up and running, uh, so you can go there. But I'll let Dr. Levine answer further. And there is the map on the health department website that does give you a sense of what pharmacies are also testing depending on what area of the state you're in. And the turnaround time, you know, the volume of testing has diminished so much uh, with the increase in vaccination so that the turnaround time can clearly be within a 72-hour window. As a PCR test? PCR test. How, how long do you expect the tests to be free for? I mean, New York just a few days ago um, said they'll start charging. How, how, I guess, how long does Vermont plan to support that? Um, you know, it's, it's paid right now by the federal government, so we're going to take advantage of that as long as we possibly can. Maybe they know something we don't. <laughs> so you, uh, all the northern border governors have asked for a meeting with Biden administration officials. Right. Is that what I, you said? Well, I asked, uh, while we were on the call, uh, I asked the NGA National Governors Association chair, which is Governor Hutchinson, uh, if uh, they would put something together for us. Uh, because the, when I asked my question, the White House had responded with, we'll get back to you. And, and I said, well, there's some other uh, governors that have an interest as well. And Governor Inslee uh, came on right after me and uh, reiterated uh, the importance of uh, traveling to Canada and back for them, for their economy. And Governor Mills uh, was after Governor Inslee and, uh, and repeated that. So I know, that, you know Governor uh, Sununu has an interest, uh, uh, Governor Cuomo as well, New York has been asking for this. So I think you can go all along the, the entire northern part of our country and uh, find governors who, who want this open back up. Uh, and the reasoning um, that they gave was they just weren't uh, weren't sure about the the Delta variant. Uh, but if you look at the data, you know they don't have the Delta variant issue in Canada that we do. So if anyone wants to be protected, it should have been them. I don't think they're uh, that's a problem for us here. We already have it. What's your feel for that? Uh, the the cause for this whole. Uh, waiting game that's going on in Washington. Do you think it's political? Do you think it's something else? I, I have a hard time believing it'd be political out of Washington. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, I, I would say, uh, yeah, I mean, some of it's politics, some of it's practicality. Uh, I, I think they're trying to, to come to grips with um, whether they ask for, to be honest with you, um, whether they ask for a vaccine type of passport. You know, are we going to um, make it mandatory for you to present some sort of vaccination uh, certificate to come back or to cross the border into the States as they have done uh, in uh, Canada? That's a requirement. So maybe that's the problem, but um, hopefully we'll, we'll come to uh, a better understanding when we have this meeting, and hopefully we can put it together fairly soon. It just seems different. Uh, the northern border is being treated extremely differently than the southern border. That's true. Just, just on that point, um, so 
here we have a date certain for Canada. Um, tomorrow's the 21st, and we haven't heard yet from the U.S. side whether the border extension right. the restrictions will be extended or not. I mean, you've sort of got a vague answer this morning. Yes. Like. I would expect they're going to have to do something by tomorrow, at least to extend it uh, further. They have to take some action. Uh, Dr. Levine, um, quick question about masking and, and, and schools. You know, I know we, we talked about the CDC guidance last week. Um, you know, the CDC says that, you know, fully vaccinated people don't have to wear masks, but the American Academy of Pediatrics is, is recommending everybody over two um, wear masks regardless of vaccination status. You know, given what we know now about the spread of the Delta variant and how that's playing out, what, which way are you leaning? Yeah, you know, this is a really important topic, and I would hate to want people to think, well, the CDC's right and the Pediatrics Academy, AAP, is wrong or vice versa, because um, they're all being, uh, I think, basing their recommendations on science and trying to be, I think, in the case of AAP, as conservative as possible uh, to keep things as safe for kids. Um, as I've said before, I'll be meeting here in Vermont. We've already set that up even before this uh, panel gave its guidelines uh, with infectious disease experts and other pediatricians and advisors later this week, uh, and along with Secretary French as well. Um, and we're going to weigh all of these uh, varying pieces of guidance and the science, really. And we're going to take all of that into consideration along with our experience with masking along with uh, what COVID uh, looks like now in Vermont and what we anticipate it will look like in the fall with regard to community transmission levels. And we'll look at vaccination rates, at least among the students who are eligible currently to be vaccinated as we prepare for the fall. So, you know, I think you have to realize when you look at the guidances that have come out, much of them are really about actually reopening school something that Vermont did a long, long time ago and has done very successfully. So what we're planning for in Vermont is a safe return to school as opposed to suddenly having to reopen school and uh, invent that entire playbook again. So we'll have more to say on that after these meetings we have this week uh, and further consideration. But I can understand where the guidance comes from because obviously kids under 12 are on, on el ineligible at this time to be vaccinated and these organizations want to keep them as safe as possible. All right, we will move to the phones now, starting with Lisa Rathke, the Associated Press. Can I just, I just want to follow up one more, um, make sure that we focus on the positive here. First of all, uh, in Vermont, with our incredible vaccination rate, um, 83 point, what was it, Commissioner? 83.2%, um, not replicated, across the country. So we're in a much different place uh, than places uh, than other states in the Deep South, for instance. Um, so when the National Association uh, makes a recommendation, they're doing it for the entire country. If they were doing it specifically for Vermont, they might come to a different conclusion. I'm not saying that we're going to come to a different conclusion. We, we, they're going to meet and, and we'll follow the data and the science and, and make uh, the appropriate decision. Um, so. Let's not lose sight of the fact that the kids are going back to school in person in September. And that's incredibly good news. And, and I don't want to lose sight of that. Lisa? Uh, can you hear me? We can. OK, uh, thanks. I wanted to go back to the vaccination rate. So are, are we seeing the rate of people getting at least one dose go up? Um, at all from recent weeks with the spread of the Delta variant? I think it's been fairly level for the past uh, few weeks, which has uh, been encouraging from my standpoint. I thought we were going to continue to see a, a drop off, but it seems to have leveled out. You know, it dropped off and then leveled out, but we're staying fairly consistent. But I'm sure with the uh, all the news about the Delta variant, it, it has helped uh, promote vaccinations, certainly has in other states and, and hopefully uh, the other uh, what is, uh, 16.7 or 16.8 percent uh, will continue uh, to get uh, 
vaccinated. Commissioner Pichak. Yeah, thank you, Governor. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, so the the reports from last week, we had 2,400 people start vaccination, but that week did include the 4th of July holiday. So we actually had eight weeks of data last week. So that was 2,400. This week, uh, 2,258. So, you know, it's pretty stable, if not even increasing a little bit this week compared to last week, considering that discrepancy in the number of days. Um, and if you look to other states and other countries, you are seeing the vaccination rates tick up again. So I think the message is getting out there and it's an important message. So hopefully uh, we'll continue to see stable, if not increasing rates here in Vermont. Okay, and then I had another question for Dr. Levine. Um, in these breakthrough cases, what kind of symptoms are are people having? I know they're, they're mild and keeping them out of the hospital, but are they pretty minor symptoms? Yeah, there's obviously a spectrum, but when we say mild, we're talking about mild upper respiratory symptoms, perhaps a cough, perhaps aches like one would get with a flu-like illness, uh, but nothing lasting and nothing that uh, is serious enough to uh, cause any you know, concern about oxygen levels, hospitalization, all of the more serious aspects of COVID. So on the milder side, for sure. Okay, thank you. And Barbara, Newport Daily Express. I have two questions. The first one is for uh, Dr. Levine. Um, uh, over the last uh, month or two, I've uh, asked you if you had any updated uh, information about the vaccination rate in Essex County, because a lot of people uh, get their medical care across the uh, river in New Hampshire. Uh, do you have any updated information that will uh, tell us what the vaccination rate is uh, for, for people who live in, the, in that area? He's conferring with Commissioner Pichek. I think they'll get that for you. So, when we, uh, Ed? Uh, okay, you not have an answer? No, the, the answer, I have an answer. The, the range was yeah. in the 54 to 56% range. Um, and we did do some conferring with New Hampshire um, you know, as I've said before, they have a new registry, and we've had a little trouble making sure that we are reconciling the data appropriately and that there's no duplication. We think that there's another 4% that we could add to that, which would bring Essex County close to or equal to 60%. So um, still not the top county in the state by any means, but certainly a much more respectable, I think, representation of, of reality there. Um, not as low as the previous numbers may have made people believe. And we continue to have uh, ongoing efforts um, in the northeastern part of the state with vaccination opportunities. Okay, thank you. Uh, excuse me. And the other question I have is have that information uh, right now, uh, but I would say uh, about a, a third of uh, those who were involved in the hotel motel uh, program uh, have uh, left, but it's, but we still have, I think, 1,500 or so uh, still in the program. As, uh, as I think I remarked earlier, uh, pre-pandemic, we had about 300 involved in the program. So. Uh, again, uh, I can have Secretary Smith or someone give you a call on that, Ed, and uh, follow up. I just don't have that information. Is 
You still there, Ed? All right, well, if you can still hear us, we'll have Secretary Smith follow up with you and we'll move to Lisa Loomis, the Valley Reporter. Good afternoon. I want to follow up on Lisa Rasky's question about breakthrough cases and ask how does that impact or affect your ongoing immunity? Does it enhance it? Does it prolong the efficacy of your vaccine or are these mild cases not conferring as much ongoing immunity? I wish I could give you an answer to that question. Um, I'm not sure we have enough study to understand how to answer that question because keep in mind the vaccines are new. Um, we know a lot about um, how they provide additional immunity to people who were previously infected. Uh, I don't think we have a lot of data on people who are vaccinated and then get uh, a mild infection. Um, science would tell me that um, you're going to have an antibody response again to that, but I'm not sure really if it's been studied, so I can't really say much more than that at this point in time. Good question, though. Thanks for your time. That's it for me. Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. Tom Davis. All right, we'll move to Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Governor. I'm wondering if Michael Harrington is available. I had a question about the unemployment report. I believe he is. Go ahead. Uh, Commissioner, um, there's always revisions, or usually there are revisions, but that was especially um, large revision um, going up to 3.1%. I know this is, isn't exactly, I know the U.S. Census takes care of a lot of this, but um, can you explain what um, might have caused that? Uh, thanks for bringing this up. I, I did have a conversation with our chief economist, Matthew Barowitz, in our labor market information division about this yesterday. Um, you know, it is a revision that's done based on the numbers collected at the, the federal level through the, the household survey. So um, I think based on what I've heard um, is, is more or less the, the challenge given COVID around capturing um, definitive data. Uh, and so that is why they call it preliminary. Like you said, this is a much larger um, change than we've seen in the past. But a lot of this, I think, is just the, the data catching up with itself. There wasn't, when I spoke with him, there wasn't any one significant reason that would have caused um, this change in the numbers, really more um, just a, a, a finalizing of the numbers based on the data and the constant review of the data. But I think what we're finding is that it's, it's extremely challenging when you've got multiple programs, um, some state programs, some federal programs, when you're trying to calculate unemployment rates across multiple states. Um, and then we get into the methodology for how the unemployment rate is calculated. And we have things like COVID qualifying scenarios or states that have uh, work search uh, turned on or off. Um, so there's a lot of factors that really weren't part of the way the model was originally designed now factoring into the modeling um, but we do believe that you know the, the change in the unemployment rate and and the increase in the un unemployment rate is really more based on the fact is a more true number because it's based on the fact that more people are actively looking for work now um, as you know the the household surveys conducted by the U.S. Census Bureau, and that information then flows through the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. The survey asks individuals when it conducts the, the household survey if they are actively looking for work or have looked for work in the past four weeks. And so if someone was not conducting a work search or was quarantining or had some other factor that played into that um, from a health perspective, they would not have been counted in the unemployment rate. And even though they may be um, uh, considered part of the, um, the labor market. So from that perspective, I think we're just getting more accurate information as we true up the numbers um, month over month. 
I was also wondering, Commissioner, if you have this in front of you, how much the state is still getting in the federal stipend? You know, I assume it's going down, but do you know how much is coming in a week on that? Just clarify for me, Tim, when you say federal stipend. The $300 a week that the feds are providing until September. Yeah, so I'm not in totality. I just don't have the number in front of me. But what we end up, so there are essentially three base programs. There's regular state unemployment, which comes out of the state trust fund. Those individuals that have exhausted that period of eligibility are now on pandemic unemployment, emergency unemployment compensation, which is the federal extended benefit. But we also have the pandemic unemployment assistance program. So those three base programs house the total amount of unemployed individuals that are collecting benefits. And all of those are eligible for the $300. So from that perspective, we know that our numbers are, and I just, I don't have the exact number in front of me, but the most recent number I saw was around 15,000 total claimants, give or take. So that would be how much we're paying out for the $300 per weekly claim. I'll send Kyle a note and see if maybe he can rustle up those numbers. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you. And I think we have Tom Davis back on, so we'll try going back to him and then to Aaron. Thanks, Jason. Appreciate it. I want to follow up on the infrastructure specifically when it comes to the bridges in Vermont. I've had some communication already with the AOT. It's been really helpful. One curiosity I have is, will you be updating in your databases or in some other place which bridges will go under construction in which sequence? That's question number one. Thank you, Tom. The Agency of Transportation has a be transparency click on its website, and you can see all of our projects listed on that. But I can also have the Structures Division follow up with you specifically to not only show you how to source that, but to get you that list of future projects. Excellent. Thank you very much. The other question I have is, part of this is the adoption of the standards that Vermont took on in 1997 has a minimum requirement of between the width of the road and the facing of the guardrail to be at least two feet. As we know, Vermont has lots of narrow bridges. A lot of the bridges that may not be getting a full makeover or replacement definitely do not have that two-foot clearance on either side. Will that be addressed if they're not on the list to be worked with? I think they're referred to as functionally obsolete or something of that nature. So we'll have to see what rules are written. We don't know how this money is going to be dispersed, whether it's going to be through the existing formulas or they're going to have... I don't think that's you, Tom, is it? No, it's not. Okay. I caught part of what you said, sir. Okay. We'll have to see. That's part of getting this right and getting the details, and I think that's where the Senate, the Congress, is working at this point, just ironing out all those details that do matter. So we'll see what comes out in the end. Okay. I appreciate always the information. AOT is always really great about getting back to people. It's very much appreciated. That's all I have. Thank you, Tom. Aaron Patenko, BT Digger. Can you hear me? Got half of that, Aaron. Yes. Okay. Well, hopefully I get clearer as time goes on. I have a question. I think this is for Dr. Levine. I get a lot of questions on, you know, what the breakthrough cases among vaccinated Vermonters look like. You know, how low are they is usually the main question. And I usually end up deferring people to the Department of Health's weekly presentation, which occasionally has 
you know, updates on breakthrough cases, but we don't have any details on how many breakthrough cases there have been over time, uh, the age of breakthrough cases, the regional distribution of breakthrough cases. Do you have any plans to kind of provide Vermonters with more detailed data on vaccinated breakthrough cases? Yes, I think we had one weekly update. It was a period of time ago that devoted a few pages to that. Uh, but we haven't done that on a consistent basis. So far, we've had 276 cases altogether of breakthrough cases. Keep in mind, we're talking about over 420,000 people fully vaccinated in Vermont to date. Um, so we're still talking at a rate of about seven in 10,000. Um, in terms of the details about you know, ages and what have you, um, I can't give you that right now off the top of my head, but we can provide an update for you um, at the next press conference. Yeah, I think that would be appreciated, but I also think that um, you, know, you, you guys have a, a data portal, you have you know, other ways of publishing data on a regular basis, and now that these yep. weekly updates only come out every two weeks, and they only have a few pages devoted to the breakthrough cases. I think you know a lot of people aren't even aware that they exist or want more detailed data to be provided in those updates. Yeah, I can understand that completely. I do want to emphasize again um, how small a portion of the fully vaccinated population these cases comprise, though each and every one of them are still important, I agree. Um, but the frequency of them uh, is not going to be high, needless to say. Yeah, I do appreciate that, that context. And I think that, you know, to a degree, maybe providing more data will help to kind of emphasize how small it is. Ab you know absolutely. What I mean? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And I do want to emphasize with Vermonters the fact that. Um, the so-called breakthrough case does not represent a failure of vaccination. It represents a success of vaccination because these are not cases that are having severe outcomes. These still represent the vaccine protecting Vermonters in the large proportion of Vermonters from any serious outcomes from contracting COVID. Um, so. Yes. Yeah. All right, thanks very much. Ann Wallace-Allen, seven days. Hi, thank you. Um, my first question is for uh, Commissioner Tierney. Um, I know you don't have a lot of the details yet, but I am curious if I, you could tell me a little bit more about the timeline for, for the broadband, for the last mile that you talked about, and um, any more details you could give us about the cost. And thank you for those questions. They're, they're excellent questions, but I'm afraid I really can't give you more information. As you are well aware, the state of Vermont has a statutory goal of getting uh, fiber built out by 2024, and clearly uh, that timeline has been overcome by events. Alone, because of the flood of federal funding that's coming out now for broadband across the nation, this is causing supply issues as well. So um, I think it's, it's fair to say that it will be done as quickly as possible. Um, I think these are questions that you will increasingly want to pose to the executive director of the Vermont Community Broadband Board, uh, Ms. Hallquist. I have heard her tentatively say that we're looking at getting the job completed in five to 10 years, but that is going to change as the facts on the ground unfold. As for costs, the, uh, the numbers that I gave you in my remarks a moment ago come from the 10-year telecommunications plan that was just published on June 30th. So they're the product of the analysis that was done by the department and the uh, consultants we were working with. And so that is a, a pretty reliable and good start. The billion dollar cost that I gave you for the, um, the complete fiber, 100 up, 100 down, build out um, to every address in the state, the billion dollar estimate derived from the Magellan report that was done I think in 2018 in that time frame, uh, keeping in mind that that was contextual because that analysis was uh, directed at assessing whether electric utilities could uh, do the job. 
but that is the, the best information we have so far, and I'm, I'm sorry that that doesn't quite meet your needs. Did you have other questions? Um, no, it was, my, my follow-up was about, about, was about that billion dollars. It doesn't really seem as though the state is going to have a billion dollars at its disposal. For, Certainly not, uh, but keep in mind that the things are changing on the ground because once you get the CUDs in, in those territories uh, going, uh, you know, industry has a role to play here too, and healthy competition takes root. And you know, once they see that folks uh, in the you know in the underserved and unserved uh, arena have 100 up, 100 down fiber, uh, I think that's going to spur a desire on the part of uh, existing service providers to compete. And so I would expect that some of that funding is going to uh, you know arise necessarily from the competitive market dynamics. You can see that already in Consolidated, for instance, where they're going through their service territory now, and they're redoing many of their lines with fiber. So it's not all, it's not all, it, you know, it, it's a good picture, I think, but because the, the demand for improvement has pent up for so long, uh, it's understandable that we're, you know, all sitting on the edge of our chairs going, when is this finally going to be done? And what I can tell you is that this federal initiative is a most welcome step that is long overdue, that has eluded the country for many, many years, and uh, for that reason alone is uh, excellent news. Anything else? No, I should, that should do it. Thank you so much. My I, pleasure. I do, have a question. Um, I do have a question for the governor. Governor, have you heard anything about the Montpelier um, proposal to allow camping in city parks for the homeless? Who I, I, are, I you know, don't know the details. I, I have heard that they are going to have um, the discussion. The city council is discussing that, but I don't know if they've come to any conclusion. Um, yeah, it sounds like they're going to have a vote this week and that um, they're sort of looking at Hubbard Park, but as far as I can tell, it would include any city park. Um, and, you know, the, the community is talking about how they, they, they are historically a community who want to help people, but some people are saying that this might not be a good thing for the capital city to have um, camping. Um, and I just, I wondered, you know, since it is sort of, the capital, if you had any thoughts about whether people should be camping in the park. I, I think they'll arrive at a decision, obviously a local issue, and they'll have to decide amongst themselves. So uh, I don't believe, I think, uh, of course, uh, it wouldn't include uh, some of the state property around the uh, community. It would have to be in uh, city-owned land. Yes, indeed. All right, local issue, thank you. Guy Page, Vermont Daily Chronicle. Governor, the Bears federal reporting system now shows 11 deaths in Vermont and 68 serious adverse events. Given that Vermont has no COVID-19 deaths under the age of 30, what do you say to college students who cannot now attend UVM, uh, unvaccinated, and those who don't want to be, uh, cannot now attend UVM uh, because they're more concerned about adverse effects of that vaccination than getting COVID itself. I, I would say I would advocate for them to get vaccinated, listen to the data, the science, and uh, with this new variant, I believe that that could change uh, some of the historical data has shown that they may uh, not uh, be as susceptible uh, to death and, and, um, and adverse health conditions if contracting the virus, but uh, this is a new, a new variant and this could change. Dr. Levine. And Guy, it's important to again note that the VAERS system is a reporting system that a person themselves can uh, report to, their family member can report to, or a healthcare professional can report to. It is considered by the CDC to be an early warning system to cast a wide net to bring anything that could possibly be connected to a vaccine as an adverse effect uh, become uh, subject to investigation. So it is not a certified data system that actually has uh, deaths or adverse outcomes uh, guaranteed to have been related to the vaccine and 
investigated in a way that one can make a conclusion. I will say that there are zero deaths reported in the state of Vermont in terms of the medical examiner and others certifying on a death certificate. There are zero deaths related to the administration of a COVID-19 vaccine. So many of these uh, events that are listed on the VAERS system, not to uh, denigrate any of the data at all, but the reality is they are just raw reports that have not been further investigated or in many cases have been investigated and have not been confirmed to be what they may say they are. So just to be clear. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Governor, uh, do you see that with this infrastructure, is this gonna mean a whole scale transition of Vermont's energy grid to uh, distributed power, wind, that sort of thing? Is that, is that gonna be one of the outcomes of this? Well, we needed, if we're going uh, to the few, move into the future, uh, to more electrification of vehicles and so forth, uh, we have to upgrade the grid, just like uh, every other piece of infrastructure, whether it's the charging infrastructure or the grid itself, uh, and then more reliance, as you are probably well aware, uh, on uh, electricity, um, the, the more up-to-date it needs to be. So um, we, I believe um, that there, this is a step in the right direction. It's about prevention uh, from any uh, um, effects of uh, of overuse of the the grid, so I think um, I think this makes a lot of sense, Commissioner Tierney. Hi, Guy June Tierney here. I thought I heard you ask whether this was going to effectuate a wholesale adoption of distributed generation and the like, and I, I think it's too soon to say that. But what this will do is provide a federal view of what ought to happen and where and how on when it comes to greening the grid and modernizing the grid from a national perspective. And that is the force that's been missing in my estimation to date. Uh, the states have done an excellent job compensating for the absence of such a voice, but that is not exactly what the FERC has been doing or ISO or other um, regional uh, grid operators. And so you know, this is an opportunity for the Department of Energy to finally give voice to why the nation needs to up its game on greening the grid and integrating renewable energy resources. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Andrew McGregor, Caledonian Record. Uh, yes, thanks, can you hear me? We can. Yep. Uh, uh, for Commissioner Levine, then um, uh, a lot of discussion about the threat of the Delta variant um, unvaccinated being most at risk and children under 12 not yet eligible for vaccines. What is the advice and guidance that you offer to families this summer, uh, you know, especially with uh, kids congregating at camps and on sports teams? Um, masks really seem to be a thing of the past, even among uh, the youth. Uh, again, Dr. Levine will give you a complete answer, but I just want to remind everybody where we're at here in Vermont. We don't have a lot of uh, community spread uh, because most people are vaccinated. So uh, I think we're in a pretty good place at this point in time. And that's very, very true. Uh, the reality is um, the Delta variant is more transmissible uh, but again, people who are vaccinated are still highly protected. And even when we talk about these so-called breakthrough cases, the level of protection across the population is still quite good, which is why we're not seeing major outbreaks like they are in states where uh, the vaccination rate, especially in some of the rural areas, is quite low. And uh, where you saw Commissioner Pichak's map light up in purple are all of those areas. Uh, unvaccinated people who could be vaccinated but have chosen not to be um, and uh, a very transmissible variant of virus. So keep that in mind. If, if a child is under 12 and not currently eligible for vaccination, yes, that does make them eligible to get COVID, of course, but at the same um, time, I need to say that we still see less and less infections in children than we do in adults with 
Delta, that's changed a little. That's increased the amount of uh, children getting infected, but that doesn't mean that every child is going to get infected because they haven't the opportunity to be vaccinated. And it certainly doesn't mean that we're seeing more serious outcomes in whatever infections do occur in young children. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, we're not seeing, again, uh, the hospitalization rates in Vermont uh, really tick up at all at this point in time with regard to having this variant that we assume is causing more and more of the infections in the state. So obviously parents want to do the most they can to keep their children safe and, and I certainly don't want to uh, reduce their um, enthusiasm for that but at the same time um, I do believe that because the vaccination rate in the state is so high, there's going to be less transmission of virus from person to person. So hopefully less opportunity for any variant to be spread from person to person, which should be protective in itself. And uh, with s such few cases lately, is the state uh, able to uh, sequence all the positives that come through now? Yeah, I was hoping to have some data to present today, but the earliest that might come back is this evening, so I can't give that to you right now. But uh, as our case numbers are not real high and our capacity for doing sequencing is increasing, we'll be uh, doing sequencing on an increasing proportion of all the cases. Right now, though, I don't have uh, any data to give you, uh, not from our own lab or from the Broad Lab in Boston, uh, which does these intermittently. They don't do that uh, every time they get a result. So we, we kind of have to wait to get that back as well as the CDC data back. Okay, thanks a lot. Greg Sikanik, Bennington Banner. Uh, hello and good afternoon, Governor. Um, the uh, Vermont State College System has uh, hit pause in the Critical Occupations Free Tuition Scholarship Program after just two weeks. Due to overwhelming demand, there's now a waiting list. Uh, I was wondering if, uh, first of all, your thoughts on the strong demand for these training programs, and second, whether you'd support uh, allocating more ARPA dollars for the program or flexibility within their budget to find money to, uh, to continue to make this more available. Um, well, first of all, it's good news. Uh, people who want to improve their skill sets, I think that's uh, something that's uh, uh, that's essential as we move forward. We, what we really need is more people uh, moving into Vermont um, because the labor force is something that is, uh, is, uh, is an issue uh, that we faced before the pandemic and uh, it's become more problematic uh, through the pandemic. Um, in terms of whether I would support, it's a discussion we'll probably have with the, with the legislature at some point in time, um, but um, but I think it's, uh, again, good news uh, for, uh, for those who are actively are pursuing uh, a higher degree or certification. That's it. Thank you very much. I, I just wanted to go back to Andrew for a minute. Uh, the best way for Vermont uh, to protect the ineligible uh, until those 12 and under uh, have a vaccine that's approved and we're hearing that it could be in September when there's one approved for a younger age group. But the best way for us to protect them is uh, for us to continue to vaccinate the eligible, uh, those uh, that 16.8% uh, that are still unvaccinated. So we should all do our part. We're gonna do our part uh, to make it as accessible as possible and as easy as possible, uh, because it's never too late. Uh, this is a, a good day uh, to get uh, to get vaccinated. And if it's not today, make it tomorrow. So with that, I think we're done. We'll see you again uh, next Tuesday.